diagnosed and that test that no one really enjoys called the uh, EMG where uh, you're looking for changes in the muscle. But I guess um, over time the research is what's really um, tried and tried to stimulate me, tried, kept us going and it's young people like Shu and Derek and other people uh, in our team who really drive and new ideas are needed. Um, <clears throat> if we keep doing the same thing what's been done for the last 150 years will end up where, where they've ended up and, uh, and that's not finding an effective therapy. Um, but uh, as opposed to this talk in a couple of years ago, there is actually a few little things happening that um, uh, some patients here in the room will know a little bit about, um, but I'll try and uh, spread it out for everyone to talk about it. So as Paul said, I'd be very keen for questions. Uh, you know, the, what one person's thinking will be what uh, another person's also thinking. Um, someone already asked about the drug Riliazole, so uh, please um, sing out uh, and ask questions uh, informally and I'll repeat them. So um, the cause of motor neuron disease is a really tricky thing to say, well, what actually causes it? <clears throat> because it is, hasn't been clear and it, it's probably the case that we've been thinking in the wrong direction for a long time. Um, but this is actually the things that I'll talk about in this, uh, uh, across this uh, next hour. So I jumped into the cause very quickly there because uh, I guess that's what really fascinates me. Um, so up on that top left hand column you can see uh, a picture of what the spinal cord looks like. And up on the top right is the person who's known as Charcot who was a, around about the 1870s and in France it's called Charcot's disease and the naming of motor neuron disease is one of those big tragedies and one of the tragedies of research is that uh, there isn't an easy name uh, and people use different names that I'll come to in a second. But originally Charcot um, worked out that the problem was in the spinal cord in the part of the uh, spinal cord called the anterior horn cell which is where all the nerves that control uh, movement, which are called motor nerves, that's where the cell body lies. So he had that theory, and until probably at the only the last 20 years, that theory has been that that's where the disease starts. But there's pretty good evidence that it's a bit more complex than that, <clears throat> that a fair bit of the disease is happening from the brain right through. Uh, and um, some of the changes of this the word, the buzzword in, um, uh, neurology at the moment is what's called connectivity. So it's a problem with the connectivity and a lot of it's probably happening centrally. It, that could mean it's actually starting somewhere else but what's driving the disease uh, is a problem in connectivity in the brain. So just getting back to those names. So um, the term MND is more of a broader term to describe both slower forms and more uh, aggressive forms. And it includes some quite slow forms. So clearly what Stephen Hawking's has is a relatively slow form. Um, and uh, the Americans on the other hand use the term ALS to mean a more uh, aggressive form. So unfortunately those two terms sort of get crossed over, but motor neuron disease is a bigger term and ALS is a smaller term that we use interchangeably. So under the American system, they use the words PLS and PMA as well. So I'll explain what that means. So what that means is what uh, motor neuron disease in its true form is, is an involvement of the motor nerves after they've left the spinal cord and also of um, the spinal cord itself. So that's why when people uh, are confident of the disease, <clears throat> they're saying, well, there's involvement of the lower motor nerve and that would mean wasting, weakness uh, and often the muscle twitching. And they're all features of what's called the lower motor neuron. So that's, you know, no one gets a diagnosis of motor neuron disease without involvement of the lower motor neurons and the upper motor neurons. And the upper motor neurons are more the ones that control coordination, balance, a lot of the speech uh, function is uh, what's called upper motor neuron. And when people uh, test for that, they're looking for brisk reflexes, they're looking for that increased tone in uh, 
in when um, uh, testing um, you know how a muscle uh, how a limb moves so um, it's it's that involvement of upper and lower motor neurons which equals the diagnosis of motor neuron disease if you've only got involvement of lower motor neurons or upper motor neurons you still fit in but it's clearly not the same as the people who've got involvement of both upper and lower motor neurons. And the truth is that 90% of the time there's evidence to say there's involvement of upper and lower motor neurons. And you only really get com comfortable with the, uh, calling something a diagnosis of motor neuron disease if you've only got upper or lower motor neurons is over time. And so clearly people who have uh, got those slower forms with only involvement of one or the other um, they'll often uh, have a period of say three to five years before a diagnosis is reached with certainty. So, has that confused anyone? Does anyone want to uh, ask a question about that, uh, about that concept of the upper and lower motor neurons? Because that's practically what, all, uh, what the disease is. What is Stephen Hawking? Well, um, I, so, um, he, he's clearly um, in a state of survival because he's on a ventilator and uh, he, um, he originally it was thought that he might have more of involvement just of the lower motor neurons. Um, I still remember talking to his neurologist at a meeting maybe five years ago and he, he made the um, comment back to me in, in a, a British sort of way to say well he has got reflexes so he was implying to me that he has got, you know, he was thinking that I was implying that he's only got a lower motor neuron form, whereas if he's got brief reflexes, it means he's got involvement of upper motor neurons. So I think, um, and again, if you believe the movie, um, what was it, the Theory of Everything, um, that uh, he got at that tracheostomy at a very early age. Um, and, um, you know, that's probably a question for later on about uh, that, but. Um, uh, he's been in a state of severe dependence that I guess um, is probably a state that uh, there hasn't really been too many people who've been wanted, wanted to be in that state of complete 24-hour care. So any more questions on that upper and lower motor neurons? Because I think, um, um, <clears throat> I think uh, it's, it's helpful to think about that. A small proportion, and it might be only about 5% of people, will show um, some involvement in either language problems or behaviour troubles. Uh, and I guess that's um, where uh, it's become clearer that the disease does have a more central cause. And so about 2011, uh, there was discovery of a new gene called the C9ORF72 gene that linked those two diseases. And that then meant that everyone who was thinking the problem was in the spinal cord suddenly had to rethink what and, and head up uh, to think more in terms of central uh, mechanisms. So um, the, the idea that MND is a genetic disease is, uh, is a tricky one. And again, I'd be keen for you to ask questions if you don't understand it. So the black and white is that for 90% of people, they're not going to pass it on to their other family members and they're not going to have had another family member who's had the disease. So for 90% of people, you can think that. For 10% of people, it runs in the family where um, <clears throat> every second person would carry that gene, and it's given the name autosomal dominant. And, that, um, in, and those people, if you've got enough people in the family, you'll know whether you're in that uh, category. And so, um, Originally, those genes were largely unknown. Uh, in about early 90s, maybe 92, the SOD1 gene uh, was discovered. Um, and then uh, gradually th up to 2010, a couple of other rare ones were found called FUS uh, um, and TDP. And then the c 9 orf 72 which is clearly much more common. So, um, the, discover, the, the race is on to discover new genes and we're working with uh, Naomi Ray at, uh, and her team at um, IMB at UQ and one of those new genes was discovered and she and Derek were part of that project as well. Um, so you could take a step back and say, um, <clears throat> well, what does all the genetics mean? Um, and someone who nicely 
tried to work it out was saying that um, the, the gene, our, how our genes are is quite complex because our genes actually change during our lifetime and the word is called meth methylation or if you see the word epigenetics. <coughs> and they're, they're, um, they're meaning that our genes can be still influencing a disease even though we may not have had them at birth. And the other concept I want to get across is that it's not necessarily one gene because you can have modifying genes uh, and causing genes. And so it's a complex interaction of those genes that probably what's important. So for anyone, it's thought that the actual component of why someone might have motor neuron disease has about 60% from a genetic whole complex form of genetic causes through to environment might be about 40%. <coughs> Thanks, Paul. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. So that's a good question, um, Nora, that um, if a person does not have a family history of motor neurone disease, their chance of actually um, having a gene that we could uh, discover is small, maybe 5%, five, five and that's just a chance uh, that they'd have one of those SOD ones or C9 or 72. But that, that chance is pretty small. So we generally say that if you don't have a family history, it, it's not all that likely that you're going to test positive for those genes, and in which case you probably should be thinking that um, um, you know, you're not really going to be passing it on uh, to family members. It's still important to be contributing to research which is trying to discover new genes. I think if someone does have a family history, there's a pretty clear case to say, well, we could estimate up to about, uh, with known genes, about 40% chance of knowing which of those genes are in the family. And I'd say to those people who do have um, uh, one of the genetic forms and would consider themselves extremely unlucky, that um, it's likely that in the next five, maybe five to 10 years that um, that's where the really big breakthroughs are going to happen, um, are in actually targeting those um, um, known, known genetic mutations. And the buzzword at the moment is called antisense uh, oligonucleotides. Um, and they're targeting the exact genetic mutation. So there's a, a disease that is very similar to motor neuron disease, which you inherit from a child called SMA. Um, and they've, they've only got the lower motor neuron form. And those kids um, often die in the first year of life. But they've been able to, um, it's fairly much uh, breaking news. I think New South Wales uh, had it quite uh, in their media last year. But they've been able to use that technology to target the exact gene mutation. So that's where um, um, one of the breakthroughs is uh, you know, anticipated. Yeah, so the, the concept is that uh, you sort of need, uh, this is a paper that a guy, uh, Amar al Shalabi, has populated, and I think he's right, is that you sort of need six hits. So it's like you're at the, um, at the show and you've got to line, line up all the ducks uh, and it goes right through. And you've got to have six hits, and at least a couple of them are probably genetic. So some of those genes are not necessarily the genes you're born with, but may have been genes that change with time. Yeah, so the, the idea is, and the word is that those genes change during your life and be, by being methylated. I guess we've um, um, uh, we just uh, wrote a paper with some people overseas on the idea that there's something intrinsically linked with evolution about, about motor neuron disease. And um, you know, there's no animal model for it. It's not associated with other diseases. Uh, it only involves motor nerves, and it affects those um, nerves that um, humans have got that animals haven't and early human species have not had. So the, the thumb muscle is very much preferentially involved. 
and speech is much more involved than swallow. And so they're very much human characteristics. So um, we've just uh, written a paper that's really tried to say there's something complex. And, you know, and for many cases, it almost seems people have been remarkably healthy uh, who have motor neuron disease uh, and then develop the disease. But, you know, that's not been studied carefully and I guess the most people are fairly healthy out in the community. <coughs> sure, and Derek might um, uh, touch on uh, some of those uh, concepts as well because uh, they're thinking uh, along novel lines. So I also wanted to say that if those people do have genetic mutations, in those families they're wildly different in how the disease um, starts and how it um, uh, progresses and there are slow forms uh, and one gene that was originally thought to be the bad one which was called the SOD1 there are some people who can inherit um, one of the mutations and not necessarily develop the disease during their lifetime and that's certainly true also of that one called the C9ORF72 so some people go through life and will not develop any symptoms of motor neuron disease or FTD despite having the mutation so it's clear that there's other factors which are really important in understanding this disease. The, on the previous slide, just down the bottom, um, on the right, which you can't really see because it needs to be darkened, but um, the, the idea of what actually causes motor neuron disease is that is the, word, the word that's being used is called RNA processing. And so people who are trying to discover um, new treatments uh, focusing on that concept because what it means is that RNA, which is um, involved in um, how our cells uh, use proteins, um, products that are normally found inside the nucleus are now out in the cytoplasm and that those, thing, those products aren't being broken down normally. So the cells have got too much of these RNA um, um, uh, things in their cytoplasm that shouldn't be there. So this idea of RNA processing is where a lot of attention is going uh, to try to find a treatment. Um, so just a um, <coughs> slide on the diagnosis of motor neuron disease. And um, I always think it's a really, um, <coughs> it's a really uh, tough um, thing to, for people to get their head around about the idea of motor neuron disease. Um, certainty, often there's a, a lot of period of uncertainty um, we wrote a couple of papers over the last couple of years with this um, dedicated researcher from WA about the, how difficult it is for patients with that diagnosis, how difficult it is um, um, for family members um, and uh, you know how neurologists could do a better job in um, trying to make the diagnosis. Um, but I guess um, it's those clinical features of seeing what's called upper and lower motor neurons Involved, being involved that makes the diagnosis. So that electrical test, which is um, unfortunately the only way really to study what's going on in that uh, nerve and muscle combination, that is the only test that's actually a positive test. There's re no really, there's no clear blood test that's going to make the diagnosis. And what you, we're largely trying to do is exclude other diagnoses. So those other diagnoses um, um, you'd, people would normally have an MRI of their spinal cord and of their brain and really that's trying to say is there any degenerative change in, the, um, in those areas that could account. Um, and um, uh, what other people would, um, there's a blood test for a, um, a disease called Kennedy's disease but probably the major one that um, people would probably be aware of is a condition, an immune condition called uh, motor neuropathy or the longer term is multifocal motor neuropathy. And so some people will have a trial of what's called intravenous immunoglobulin, IVIG or Intragam, and they'll have that um, usually for a period of up to six months to see if it's making any difference because it cl it's clear it doesn't make any difference if the diagnosis is motor neuron disease. So um, I will... Um, then, I'll, I'll let, I'd be keen to, for people to uh, share their experience or discuss uh, some of the issues related to the diagnosis. But um, I guess, um, having been um, doing this for many years, I guess what I see is patterns. Um, and um, it's 
most people do fit into a pattern uh, in one way or the other, and it's the middle-aged guy with involvement of one arm first, because um, uh, it, all, it usually always starts asymmetrically. Um, an older woman starting in bulbar function, an older man where both arms, by the time they come and see me, have involvement. Um, um, the trickier one, and the one that often uh, leads to a slower diagnosis, is someone presenting with a foot drop. Um, and that takes uh, time to work out what's going on with that. Um, but the description of a man in the barrel would be the ones who has trouble uh, using their arms, um, that spreads, but other functions remain uh, relatively preserved. And that, um, that, what we would call that pattern, would be associated with quite a longer survival. Um, <clears throat> so we had a, a very smart guy, um, Matt Devine, um, look very carefully across all of our uh, patients along this, uh, along and, and look at this patterns of spread. And he also tried to come up with a nice um, uh, method of uh, trying to grade things. And I, I guess um, for those involved in research at the Royal Brisbane, um, uh, um, we've got a very smart young fellow called Gaurav Singh who's now going to be involved in that. Um, there's very much those clear patterns, and again, this is this idea of the evolution uh, theories of motor neuron disease with involvement of, it's, uh, I mentioned about the thumb, but it's actually that, that side of the hand, um, and uh, um, you know, th th that pattern would be very typical uh, of motor neuron disease. The other uh, patterns are also intriguing in that um, the eye muscles are um, almost always preserved for a very long period of time. Um, and that the muscles around the uh, bladder and bowel control, um, sexual function are relatively preserved. So it's only really the motor nerves that are involved. So the, motor, the eye movements do eventually go, and so Stephen Hawking's would be an example where he's been uh, unable to use those eye muscles. But that's taken 20, or 20 30 or longer years. So any questions on, um, on the diagnosis or what I'd say are the clinical features. Yeah, so sleep, um, so it hasn't been looked at carefully like that. Um, you know, clearly um, that doesn't mean um, insomnia might not have a role because uh, Parkinson's disease, I guess, um, um, it's become clear that people who have more vivid night nightmares and dreams, um, that's a bit of a risk factor for developing, uh, say, Parkinson's disease. Um, and that's only recently, and clearly most people have dreams unrelated to Parkinson's disease, but um, that's only been recently identified. I guess most people uh, think of broken sleep in the setting of involvement of the breathing muscles, um, and most people would pay attention to, to that. Um, so I haven't really heard too much about people saying insomnia is a big feature, but, but I would say it hasn't been studied carefully. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. Insomnia is really, really common, I've got to, I've got to say. In the general community, it's um, really common. Um, but it's interesting that it sort of happened in relation to the diagnosis. Oh, well, we'll ask people. I guess that's the beauty of it. While we're talking about sleep, does sleep happen here like you hear pre-therapy? No. Again, again, we wouldn't have thought so. So the, the, the typical thing is um, sleep apnea, again, is very common. And it's related to the closure of the um, muscles in the back of the throat. Um, so, uh, again, again, it's not well understood. The way I I think of it, and I haven't seen anyone write this, is that. 
you, your foot drop is involving the, what they call the lower spinal cord, which is also called the lumbar region. And that's a long way from involvement of the arms and speech, which is right up at the top. And it comes down to, you know, how does motor neuron dis disease spread? And I just think it takes a, a longer to spread. That's my, that's my, that's my theory. No, see, um, but again, again I w I'd also say that although there are patterns, um, there, are, there clearly are many other factors about the disease, and those are the things that have really challenged to try and say, well, why haven't we got an effective therapy, is the, there's this great variability in, in things. So although I might say that um, foot drop might be associated with longer survival, that that it all depends on how the disease spreads. Um, so I've just got a few slides up here. So, <clears throat> you know, one other fascinating thing is the average age of um, motor neuron disease is about 55 to 60. So that's about the average age of what we see in the clinic. So that's um, quite different from the other neurodegenerative diseases, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease, that just steadily go up. So whereas motor neuron disease seems to be highest in that period 55 to 60 and then becomes quite uh, re much less common uh, over the age of 80 to be making new diagnoses. And there's a funny gender um, relationship in that it's more common in men um, and um, it's also a bit different like in the clinic we would say it's notably more common in men but when they actually do a proper population it's only 1.2 as to 1 but it still makes you wonder why. <coughs> and then men present more in those middle age years and women present often a little bit older years. So um, again, that's not um, well understood. Um, the actual chance of presenting in arm, leg or speech is all about the same. So all about 30, 30, 30. And occasionally, in about 5% of the time, people will present with either what's called cognitive involvement, that language or behaviour component, or they'll present with breathing involvement. So they're relatively uncommon. So I won't, I won't stick to that. So um, just to um, spend a little bit of a time on the um, <coughs> management. So um, in terms of any, any drug therapy that's approved by the government that a script can be written for that has some evidence, it's really only the drug really is old. Um, so Rilizol has been around since mid-90s. Um, it has a modest benefit at slowing the disease progression. The obvious question is how long for, and that had, was never studied properly. Um, it does work a bit because we've been involved in two treatment trials and the, those um, new therapies were looked at carefully, but people could stay on the Rilizol. So it wasn't a study, they weren't studies looking at whether people uh, did better on Riliazole or not, but the new drugs um, did showed no benefit on survival, but Riliazole still seemed to show a modest benefit. Um, now the studies weren't done looking at that, but um, that's the observation, and if uh, we haven't done it for uh, quite a while, um, but we did, um, you know, we did see a slight difference in the people in our clinic who were on Riliazole compared to the ones who weren't. Um, right. <clears throat> so, um, really, as all side effects are, and again, I would say 80, 90 percent of people would tolerate it without too many side effects. Nausea and lethargy would be the reasons to say just stop it. <clears throat> you can sometimes get an idea by looking at liver function tests, but we w it wouldn't usually say stop it unless they're um, at least two to three times normal. Uh, Uh, it's not causing detrimental effects on the liver. So, you know, of everyone I've seen who's been on Riliazole, I've only ever seen one person who was on Riliazole and Naltrexone, and he's the only one I've seen who actually had um, uh, liver damage. So, you know, clearly, it, you know, if people stop it, then uh, their liver function, um, um, you know, goes back to, should go back to what it was. 
Um, so we would say testing the liver function tests after a month and then probably every month or two. Uh, in our experience about two-thirds of patients would choose to take it. Um, the other third would say, well, it doesn't work well enough or I'm concerned about side effects. Um, and it's a twice a day, one tablet twice a day. If people were noticing side effects or uh, those liver tests were going up, we'd say get, drop back to one tablet a day. <clears throat> yeah, um, it, it, in retrospect, they could have done more careful study back in the early 90s. Um, it has an effect on nerve excitability and it's meant to block glutamate and they measured the glutamate in the spinal cord. So it's some, the, the idea in motor neuron disease is that <clears throat> there's a problem in the nerves being too excitable um, and the work done in Sydney at the Brain and Mind Centre for over the last 10, 15 years is nicely shown and I guess um, that's what we see is that people have cramps and muscle twitching as early features of motor neuron disease and often the emotions coming out a little bit early would also be an early feature of motor neuron disease and some of those problems of nerve excitability are early features that may not necessarily be later features. Um, so really as all I think is tied up in um, having an effect on that nerve excitability. Um, so actually I noticed Nicole's here, because uh, welcome Nicole. Uh, people would say rash that they'd notice occasionally, because um, Nicole's the front line, and I'll introduce her in a minute, but, um, but she would be the one who'd feel a lot of uh, calls about it. Um, what else would you say, Nicole? So Nicole, say, uh, just for the point, saying uh, nausea and fatigue. Yes, it clearly is, and uh, again, Shu and Derek's um, uh, research is really interesting on that idea. So, <coughs> true. So, uh, fatigue in motor neuron disease is really complex because um, it can be related to people's mood and depression can be related to medication that they're using or um, it can be related to their nutrition and if they've dropped off what they're eating. And clearly the most important cause for fatigue is breathing function. So, you know, uh, f fatigue would, and I guess um, um, patients do mention fatigue and, um, you know, it's a hard symptom to try and get an easy measure on and study and research, but it's clearly important. Shoes nodding. <clears throat> yep. Yeah, I would have thought that you'd notice that within a week or two. Um, so the second one there I've got a, as a peg, um, that's called a gastrostomy tube or um, uh, the way they do at PA hospital, they would also call it a rig, where it's radiologically inserted, whereas PEG means a gastroenterologist does it as a procedure similar to an endoscopy. <coughs> it takes slightly longer. So um, PEGs are complex, and many people um, would say, well, that's not something I want to think about, not something I'm going down. Um, and we would say that's fine. So um, equally, we would say, if it's, a, if it's bloody hard to eat and it's a big effort, um, a peg can really make your quality of life a lot easier. Um, you know, from a point of view of reducing weight loss, uh, a peg can be very much um, helpful. <coughs> uh, sure, and Derek might show some data that has a, uh, an effect on survival. Um, but uh, if people do consider pegs, we often are fairly early on that. Uh, on that. And it's usually people with bulba involvement. So it's probably less so that people with onset in the legs would be facing any decisions about a peg. It'd be much, you know, the much less common. Um, yeah. So I mean. 
yeah, so people could have pegs in and not and um, and and we wouldn't, you know, it's placed usually in the region of the stomach, um, and certainly someone would have it here and we wouldn't know. Um, it can either be as a tube coming out or a little button. Um, and people can have, um, and usually under the guidance of a dietitian, receive uh, nutrition, either as a continuous infusion or as a, um, a bottle being um, placed. Yeah. So, and some people can continue to have their normal, uh, have, as, uh, sorry, can continue to have um, uh, oral intake. And so the speech pathologist becomes very important because they're the sort of ones, people, who's sort of giving that guidance on when the swallow's becoming unsafe. So I guess um, in the general sense that um, we consider a peg if people are rapidly losing weight, if it's too much effort to eat, or people, some people might have an aspiration event. <coughs> and they'll do exactly what I'm doing, which is cough. Um, and uh, it means something's gone down the wrong pipe. And if that leads to ammonia, that may lead to a, um, getting uh, treated with antibiotics. Um, and people would then say, well, how do I prevent that? But I guess it's not a decision that, you know, it's probably the minority, minority of people would uh, um, have placed. But we would also say that respiratory function is important because I guess we don't see too many issues with the placement of a peg in people who's got, who've got reasonably good respiratory function. Um, but it's a bigger, bigger deal when respiratory function's starting to become quite reduced. <coughs> yeah. Yeah, well, sure. Well, well, I would say I wouldn't get too fussed about the barrel. Would be uh, one one way of looking at it. Um, that would probably be my simple answer. That um, you know, um, there's no, it's not, it's not as bad having that barrel. And and body shape changes because yes, you do lose muscle bulk, but you don't lose the barrel. You need to keep the barrel. <laughs> well, it's hard to lose it. But I think if you look out in the community, it looks like it's pretty hard to lose. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Shu, what would you say, Shu and Derek? What would you say about the, the barrel? There's two things going on. There's weight, but also where you carry your fat changes as well. So it's not just, sorry, it's, it's not just about, um, it's not just about the barrel, it's the barrel itself. Uh, I'll explain that in a minute. And then the other thing is uh, the muscles around your stomach might also weaken. So so that brings on also to that question of NIV. So um, and that's um, use of essentially what's the snorer's mask on settings that are called BiPAP rather than what snorers would be using, which is called CPAP. And it's pretty clear that that does make a big difference in those people who choose that or um, and continue it. Um, and not everyone um, decides that they'll use it. And some people um, um, it gets recommended for, but they don't feel they've got symptoms that are benefited by it. Most people would say, well, they don't put, they don't keep going with wearing a, a machine. But the <clears throat> the technology and the noise of the machine has reduced uh, and. Uh, most people who've got symptoms of feeling breathless are very happy when they've uh, been using that. Equally, there's very effective medications that can take away the feeling of breathlessness. So you can feel fairly comfortable that the, fit, the sensation of breathlessness is one symptom that can be managed. Um, <clears throat> I think I... Yeah, so the survival advantage um, is, for people who tolerated that uh, non-invasive ventilation was actually up to about a year longer in terms of survival. But people who had vulva involvement of speech and swallow um, and saliva, they had uh, a, a, um, uh, less a less ability to tolerate and continue using it. So, um, and, you know, I haven't got a better ma picture and I need to get a better picture, but the masks are clearly better than that and they will modify them uh, and um, the services 
at the Prince Charles Hospital and the PA Hospital, um, the MND clinics there are very much led by uh, respiratory physicians. Um, the respiratory physicians are <clears throat> well set up in that there's usually about three of them who are taking an interest in this uh, and the sleep nurses are also uh, uh, able to also provide that support. Um, I guess um, um, symptom management is um, very much a, a focus um, and we would say that's uh, the, one of the major things at the MND clinic that most of the symptoms we can um, um, come up with ideas about how to tackle. Um, and I've got a, a slide that uh, if I've got time I'll show. <clears throat> so Nicole and I, about 2007, would that be right? 2004 when we first came up with the idea and we, I guess we weren't ever funded by the Queensland Government so we, that's why it's held on Friday lunchtime because we were doing it then. Um, but we gradually grew and about, you know, from 2004 when the idea came um, and it's continued to grow. Um, so Allied Health variably join us, but speech pathology and dietitian are very um, much involved in our clinic. We do it at the same time and if need be at Royal Brisbane uh, with the respiratory physicians uh, and the palliative care team have also been very good in providing support. Um, in, at, invariably we've had involvement where the M&D Queensland have also been uh, part of the uh, uh, clinic in the waiting room and being available as well. Um, Prince Charles Hospital uh, has a bit more respiratory focus but also offers a very comprehensive service um, and Nicole and I go out and do a clinic there. Um, and PA Hospital with the team led by uh, Craig Hukins, um, they're very much a dedicated service that for people south of the river and perhaps out to Ipswich. Um, and Gold Coast has also had an effective um, uh, motor neurone disease clinic. I guess um, further north, um, um, one thing that we uh, do is telehealth and uh, um, you know, it would be nice to be able to grow that. Um, <clears throat> so just on that idea of therapies, um, I thought I'd um, throw up this slide because um, um, I guess most people at the clinic um, over the years do come up and talk about different therapies and some um, you know, we would say that there's no harm in trying any therapy if it's not going to cost you too much money, <clears throat> if it's not going to have side too unbearable side effects, and if it's not going to take you away from um, people uh, who you want to be around. I mean, I can remember one of these um, uh, support groups and someone raised the, uh, about going over to Israel, and uh, she went over there for a good six or so months and didn't spend it with a, and she was with a younger family, and we'd have to say that was an absolute... Um, tragedy for a therapy that uh, wasn't working. So um, I, I think if you're thinking of alternate therapies, you know, there's just six uh, guide points. Some therapies come and go. Naltrexone was very popular in that period around 2005, 6, and then seemed to disappear. And now it's uh, coming back that uh, I noticed a few patients are uh, uh, mentioning Naltrexone again. Um, you know, and I'm you know, if people want to mention um, different uh, therapies, uh, please do. Some therapies have never really been tested in studies. So cannabis would be a nice example, which is a hot topic, uh, which really has never been studied. <clears throat> and you'll find individual patients who say it works. Um, but, you know, we've seen a number of patients who uh, have been taking it and it clearly hasn't made any difference to what we would have said is the rate of progression. So what we would say is the disease looks fairly linear but very different for any two people. Has anyone got any therapies they want to uh, mention? Yeah, so that's more going to be, <clears throat> that's not naming an individual drug. So that would probably be, you know, you could wonder if there's a bit of science behind that. So some people do take antioxidants and no real, no real issue. Perhaps say in the, again, 10 years ago, everyone was taking creatine and uh, muscle supplements. And again, they were shown not to really make too much difference for people who are on a healthy diet. 
you know, the therapies that are floated around. Last year, turmeric was fairly popular. I'm just trying to think, Nicole could help me, if um, what other therapies have been um, raised just in the recent clinics? Yeah. So lithium went through a, a period, a period of a couple of years. Um, so the stem cell therapies, I've probably seen probably five people, maybe four people who've gone to either uh, Germany, Italy, or China. Um, the stem cells offer a lot of hope. And uh, in California, there's a guy called Don Cleveland who's had an enormous amount of money to try and properly study s stem cells and has a high chance of um, coming up with something meaningful. But at present, stem cells um, is just to be a word of caution on those um, because uh, most of the times in the countries like Italy and Germany, the centres that offer the stem cell therapy usually get about two years before their government closed them down. Um, Israel's a bit, um, a bit uncertain about. There's a group there called Brainstorm. They're trying to um, um, do a study in the US. They're being a little bit careful about saying what's in their stem cells. Um, but um, um, but the one main one would be say India or China have continued. Yeah, so um, that's a good question. So um, a guy in Melbourne, Peter Crouch, has very much um, uh, based uh, his research on copper. So he's got a product called Copper ATSM, which might have benefit in um, his work, which was based on the sod one mouse. So copper and the sod one's got this interaction between uh, it's at, um, uh, it, it inter interacts across uh, two chemicals. One was zinc, um, but it affects copper metabolism. So he he has shown uh, and had also looked at imaging. So he was doing a study um, last year, and I think through Macquarie on actual copper therapy, but he hasn't. Um, there hasn't been any results uh, uh, come from that. The other one, um, which was at a similar stage, was the HIV drugs. I think had the name Trimec, and that was also a, um, a trial that was running up to the end of last year. Uh, and again, they haven't produced results. Well, um, so naltrexone is used for drug addiction, and I'm don't, not sure about the dose. Um, but someone had been saying it might have benefit from motor neuron disease. Um, and as I said, in the mid-2000s, it was quite popular and then seemed that for patients to be trying naltrexone. But most people will not notice any side effects on it. Uh, it's just unclear whether they'd get any benefit. I mean, that's the same theory behind cannabis. It just hasn't been studied um, with any rigour. So I mentioned uh, telehealth. Um, so Queensland's a big state, so we've been keen um, um, with Nicole up the back to uh, promote telehealth, and that's a very old photo of us. Um, so the multidisciplinary care is very much the model that um, we've done for um, uh, our clinics um, in terms of involvement of people um, across allied health, uh, Nicole, myself, and other individual specialties. And I mentioned support before. So I guess um, we've had those um, uh, principles that I've put up there about um, patient autonomy, time to make decisions, continuity of care, um, and informed choices. Um, and involvement of those other support organisations with um, respiratory, gastroenterology from the point of view of the PEG, sometimes rehabilitation services, uh, but very much involved with allied health and community uh, involvement with uh, organisations like the MND Queensland. And symptom management, if I've got time, um, it'd be nice to cover a few of those uh, points, but I don't think we'll... we'll so uh, if we went through them, um, bulba is often the issues of speech, swallow and saliva. Um, and again, speech pathology has a very key role for that. Um, the communication devices has been really quite um, uh, an evolving field. Uh, it would have been that, say, t five, ten years ago, everyone was talking to MND Queensland about light writers. Nowadays, that would be a lot less common. and People might be talking about iPads that uh, 
um, M&D and me uh, provided. So um, the swallow involvement seems to be a later phenomenon, um, speech pathology and about what texture and positioning is needed. The saliva management is something we've taken quite an interest at Royal Brisbane and Women's Hospital. It's a tricky one because you often uh, go between too thick and too thin. Uh, head drops, probably if I'm thinking down, head drops pretty rare, but again there's a, quite an effective collar uh, that can be considered or neck support. Um, the um, issues of um, pain, so pain is not a feature of motor neuron disease in, in the pathology of it, but pain is very common. So if people listed their symptoms, they'd probably have pain in there, but it's secondary to la not using your muscles right. And so <coughs> shoulders would be a common one where people, by not exercising, are going to get shoulder pain. And Nicole's got a nice um, uh, brochure about uh, how to uh, tackle that. What's up? Well, what the endoscopy would be normal, and I mean the role of gastroenterology is only in that question of PEG, which is probably less common. So they, it's more the speech pathology that would be uh, involved. Um, I, I probably didn't list uh, constipation, which is very much tied to lack of movement, and also some of those medications that are involved uh, in management of uh, saliva. Mobility issues are, are very large. Um, and again, physiotherapy, exercise physiology becomes very important. Use of the arms and involvement with occupational therapy. Um, and then I also commented a bit on um, some of those uh, symptoms of uh, uh, mood changes um, and sometimes those emotions coming out a bit too easy, easily. Uh, and again, we would target therapy based on that. Stiffness and spasm for people who've got a lot of involvement of those upper motor neurons, um, we'd often try medication for that. Yeah, I'd probably only say about 5 or 10% of people would, would feel that's a big deal, but it is exactly as you say that the muscles get a bit weak, but uncommon. But it's something, again, I guess um, what I'd say is that many of the symptoms, there's a way of tackling them. But as you all know in this audience, it's a tricky disease because um, the more you tackle it, um, you know, the disease does progress. So. Um, those issues of mobility become um, more and more challenging. Just on that symptom management, on our website, Nicole and uh, Speech Dogs and Barrel did a great presentation on symptom management. So if you go to our website, there's a presentation there, or if you Google YouTube, Community of the it's on there. So it's about an hour and a half presentation on symptom management going through the all those things. We'll have another one this year. Uh, well, I, th I think people have different ways of, you know, and largely based on um, mobility issues. But constipation you want to try and avoid uh, and stay on top of would be the general rule. Yeah. So I'll just um, touch a little bit on research, um, but Chu and Derek are going to talk about the range of things that are happening at Royal Brisbane and Women's Hospital. I guess we've been trying to um, target um, the um, the breadth of it, um, we in the actual clinic, we we have tried to separate out research directly from the clinic, um, so that we can focus specifically on the research questions. Um, <clears throat> but on the, uh, the, any day that any patient comes, and I know the clinics uh, at PA would be the same. The only reliable measure of what's happening is this questionnaire called the ALS-FRS. It's a 48-point scale. It's a questionnaire that takes about um, um, 10 minutes to do, 15 maybe. Uh, it can be done over the phone and we would be doing that every three months on people. And we'd also be keeping an eye on breathing function, mainly because the breathing measures are just not that um, reliable. You know, if we looked at what everyone's breathing function here, we'd see a huge variation. So what really matters is what, what your variation is for you. 
Um, so again, we'd be checking that every three months. And we'd be looking at height and weight. Well, height won't change, but we'd be looking at weight, and that will be also um, linked in with um, the research that Sue and Derek's doing. And we'd be you know, looking at how things change in, ch in terms of involvement of upper and lower motor neurons. Um, and we'd be collecting blood. And so we've got two research nurses, Sue and Kate, uh, who are involved in that. And Uh, Anything specific? So with the blood, that does go to a few different places. So um, what we've been trying to look at is blood biomarkers. So the main biomarker is this word called neurofilaments, just to try and see how that changes. For people who agree to ha contribute to research, some of the blood goes to the uh, U University of Queensland trying to discover new genetic markers. Some of the blood would go to Shu and Derek's research if people are participating in that. And then um, we have been involved in collaborations with places such as Macquarie, where also we've sent blood. So um, uh, there's a young researcher, Fleur, from um, uh, UQ, at a place called IMB. She's trying to discover this new um, uh, biomarker. Uh, so um, it's really quite exciting what she's doing with what's called a word that's called cell-free DNA, and she measures that in people's blood. Um, I guess if I'd given this talk two years ago, I don't think I would have mentioned uh, clinical trials, um, but um, um, it is a changing area. I guess I'd say that the clinical trials are at an early stage. Um, the, over the last five years, we were involved in two big international trials, and uh, it was disappointing that both of those were unsuccessful. <coughs> so they were funded by big pharmaceutical companies, um, and big pharmaceutical companies put in 20 or 30 million dollars into a clinical trial and aim to get something from 300 to 1,000 patients involved, whereas these trials are at a smaller, a smaller stage. So um, they're looking at um, um, you know, smaller numbers of patients and uh, what's called phase one and phase two. So phase one's proving that the drug's doing what it's meant to do and looking at the side effects of, of safety and tolerability and getting some sort of early measure on whether the drug has any efficacy. But proper studies would be more phase three, which looks at um, how the drug works against various markers of, of the disease progression. Now, some people argue that that traditional way of doing trials is, um, um, you know, flawed uh, for people with motor neuron disease because it's such a variable disease. I think I've got a slide on the challenges for research. Um, but these um, studies here are more based on um, trying to look more carefully in smaller numbers of patients. So um, the Implicit Bioscience is a group in Seattle. Um, we got funding from Fight MND, which is Ian Davis and Neil Danaher. Uh, and, um, they used to be cure for MND down in uh, Victoria, and they uh, um, last year announced a number of uh, very large, well-funded trials. I think um, Ian and uh, Neil, who've both got motor neuron disease, said, well, you researchers have got to get moving, you've got to get cracking. We will fund trials that um, uh, are on patients and are going to happen soon. So um, you really got to applaud um, Ian for that. Um, so they uh, uh, funded that, and so we've had a, a trial which is uh, on 10 patients. Uh, I guess um, uh, Mark uh, was a kind participant, but the, um, uh, the one uh, way to better understand the disease was to um, uh, look at how the drug is working, both in blood and different other things, including spinal fluid. Uh, we've been trying to explore how can we give that drug regularly I think the science, scientists behind, the, um, um, behind the, um, that drug are very much believing that it needs to be given at irregular intervals um, and we're putting in for additional funding through the American uh, ALS Association and if we manage to get that funding in that they believe that the drug is worth studying, that'll be very exciting and that'll probably happen over the next month or so. Um, Cytokinetics is also a group from the US and they're looking at an oral tablet. Um, that study is probably 
not going to happen until maybe May or June. Tecfidera is a drug that's been used in MS. Uh, it's pretty well tolerated. It's an oral tablet. Uh, and probably in March, maybe the end of March, um, we would be talking to patients about, about uh, whether they'd be interested in being involved in that study. Um, squalamine is uh, um, Pam McComb at Wesley Hospital, um, a, um, um, uh, a, a scientist who, uh, who made a brilliant discovery in a hematological disorder has turned his attention. Uh, and squalamine is uh, acting on the idea that there are uh, gut toxins. And so that study is also running and up, is up and running at uh, the Wesley Hospital with uh, Pam McComb. Um, and one that we're at that early phase of um, talking to the people behind the study is the last one called uh, levosimendin, which again is an oral tablet um, um, by one of these mid-range. So I mentioned before the big pharma companies had two unsuccessful studies. These are largely being driven by smaller companies um, and the cost is, is not at that 20 to 30 million. It's usually in the 1 to 5 million uh, range to look at these smaller studies. But I guess it's um, uh, in interesting times in that I um, reckon by the middle of the year I'd be, we'd be talking to patients that we'd be keen for them to be involved in a study. Uh, and um, I guess patients are going to get a fair bit of choice in which one they um, think has the most uh, uh, chance. I'll put down um, three other drugs at the bottom because they've also been pretty active um, in the last year. Um, so Adaravone is the one that... Um, Netherlands Treeway were involved in that, and Mitsubishi in Japan have been the major drivers for that. So the reason I don't think anyone's really pushing a Daravone is the cost is quite uh, high, and it's a very intensive course. So the drug is given daily for two weeks, and then two weeks off, and then daily for another two weeks, and that continues for six months. Um, and has to be given in a hospital as an infusion. Um, the evidence that it worked, um, the original study's been fairly strongly criticised, um, and uh, I guess um, the, for a variety of those reasons, not many patients have really been pushing it in Australia. Fight MND were, I think, looking at how that 150,000 for a six-month course could be funded, or how could we bring that drug into Australia. But I haven't heard anything in the last uh, three or four months about it. Um, mazetinib was a drug that came from the European conference um, middle of last year that um, was also appears to have some promise um, based on early research, but uh, again was criticised. So I guess that's the tricky thing with any of these research projects you see at the top. They've got to be done very carefully because at the end of the day, people will scrutinise how they're done um, and, and um, if the evidence for benefit is fairly modest, which is what Adaravone and Mazitinib was, um, people are going to be critical about whether it should be used in people like you. Uh, cannabis, um, I think uh, there's some interest at the Gold Coast about um, having a clinical trial about that. The tricky thing about that is um, cannabis oil, by the way, it's not um, the plant. Um, the tricky thing about that is that peop some people are taking um, different preparations and um, there's THC and another compound and um, the actual balance of the two seems to be very different depending on where you're, um, um, where you're accessing it from. And it's also quite expensive. So, again, it hasn't... We, we, we haven't shown much interest in that because there hasn't really been any animal model or any science behind thinking that it works. I'll put over on the side um, two projects that are Queensland based that um, I'm sure we'll be involved with. Uh, a complement study with Trent Woodruff at the UQ. Um, so the nature of the, the drugs up the top is that they've been used in humans so they can be used as studies but if you've got a new compound that's never been used in a human, you've got to prove that that drug's safe in some other model besides that little mouse. So you've sort of got to go and prove it's safe in another animal model. And I guess that's where these studies uh, with FA4 uh, and complement uh, lie at the moment. But I think Trent Woodruff's um, 
if anyone uh, hears him, he's very uh, dedicated and very much wanting uh, effective therapies. So, <clears throat> you know, the issues of clinical trials um, are that the disease is very variable. Um, and really, um, the um, survival it can be very, very hard to pick. Um, and people take, make choices which make it very difficult. The we need better biomarkers of what's really occurring in the disease. Um, if people choose to be using things such as the non-invasive ventilation uh, or more active management, then um, you know, you're affecting survival automatically. So if you're using non-invasive ventilation, the disease is still happening, but you know, it's, a, it's a difference uh, in terms of survival. And the trials, when they've been run, are quite short. Um, so really, a trial for motor neuron disease got to run for 12 months. You know, if you really want to know what's happening, it should run for 12 months. Um, so that's, uh, that's nearing the end of what I was going to say. So um, the ice bucket uh, challenge certainly generated an enormous amount of um, uh, awareness for motor neuron disease and it also generated money that's uh, contributed to research. Um, some of that's been done at UQ. So through Naomi Ray. Um, it's a disease where people tend to work very well together. Certainly at the research level, um, <clears throat> you know, people don't go in there with big egos and they, um, um, they're all, there's a fair bit of dedication um, to try and make a difference uh, for this disease. So um, as I said, it's great, you know, Nicole up the back is um, coming out to answer questions and be involved. Uh, Matthew Keenan is the guy up on the top right um, who uh, is very much an Australian leader in this area of motor neuron disease. And I guess Scott motivated all of us uh, to uh, keep going. So thanks very much. They, they want to hear sure.